Great to have you here today. Good Friday, and what a show. I am really looking forward to talking to Professor John Searle. Probably, you may remember this guy of some footage you might have seen on the Discovery Channel. And it is such a fascinating story. You know, whenever I've heard over the years, somebody invented a, a machine that was uh, uh, a perpetual motion machine, you're always a little suspicious. You're always wondering, well, how come nothing ever comes of these things? And I'm, I've heard about Professor John Searle. And, and let me just kind of give you an overview the way I understand it. We have him on the line, and he's going to start off the show. Because what John believes, and many people believe, that the device that he created, he invented, can actually save our planet from an environmental disaster. Uh, there is a documentary out about the guy, and I will give you all that information. It's just excellent. So here's, from what I understand, uh, the gist of the story. At age 14, he was born, I think, in 1932. At age 14, he was apprenticed as an electrical engineer in England, uh, where he was trained to rebuild and recondition electric generators and motors for British Rewinds Limited in London. In 1946, he built the first prototype of the Sear Effect Generator. And that, when he first activated it, it got charged with energy. The device kind of became a superconductor, lots of high voltage. It levitated, crashed right into his roof, he said. And beyond that, it went on. At age 21... He was appointed foreman overseeing 11 areas of research and development for the Midlands Electrical Board in England. He produced 40 of these flying discs, and hundreds, if not thousands of people, witnessed these. And in fact, many of them thought they were aliens. And I'm going to play some footage here in just a second, some audio footage of uh, media coverage of this in England in 1965. Let me just continue a little bit here. The Air Commodore knew... What he was doing and assured the public it's not aliens, it's the work of John Searle. So the question is, what is it? You know, it seems to work by converting random electrons into usable energy. So is it some kind of uh, something that using quantum level of physics? I don't know what I'm talking about. All I know is something is going on. The people have been trying to buy this guy out. He's had threats, and it is an honor to talk to him. So before we go to him, let me hear that footage, Pete. This is just a little clip of some of the uh, footage of people in Warminster where he was doing this pretty much just to kind of, uh, for fun. And we'll talk about that. He, he kind of liked to see people get, uh, uh, freaked out over his little creation. But play some of that coverage, Pete. Many people here tonight are afraid of the thing. If tonight, we can contribute something constructive to the explanation of these phenomena it might be able to assure these people who have nothing to be alarmed about the noise did occur and i confirmed the lady who was too scared to disclose her name that she did hear it and so did i it woke me up i was wakened by this dreadful droning sound and um, I went to the bedroom window and I saw this brilliant object it was quite low in the sky and I live up Beacon View that way and it seemed to be travelling very slowly and I was petrified I just couldn't move I was shaking like a leaf I just couldn't move and I, it was going on for half an hour and later, I'm going to let you hear what some of the police had to say. It is an honor to talk to Professor John Searle. Thank you for being on the Alan Handelman Show. Thank you. You're very well. Can you hear me okay? Just want to make sure you're... I could too speak a little louder. All right. I'll, I'll talk a little louder. And Pete, give a little more gain on his volume. It would be perfect. Uh, by the way, he's talking live from the Tesla Tech Conference and I, I was up till about 3 o'clock in the morning researching and watching and looking over footage about your life. And I am uh, uh, blown away. I'm uh, blown away. When you just heard the footage that I played from 1965 of people in Warminster who were reacting uh, to your flying discs, 
at that time, and I kind of said this because I took this from things I heard, you were kind of, in a way, amused by that and kind of enjoyed the fact that people thought it was some kind of alien craft. A am I right on that? You are dead right. It was a real funny time. Everyone in the team really enjoyed it. And to be honest, honest there were police officers on the team who were also enjoyed it as well. That's what the people don't understand. CID man was on the team, and we we just had a damn good time. That's it. Now this is in, you were you were obviously at fourteen years old as an apprentice electrical engineer in England. You really had a knack for this kind of stuff. At that time, when you were fourteen years old and you built this first device, did you have any idea what was going on? Because uh, I know. You had some dreams and some nightmares, kind of like premonitions, that led to this. You want to spend a little time on the background in that first machine that you built? Right. What happened was that uh, I had this series of two types of dreams. They are related. I called them Dream 1, Dream 2. Then mm -hmm. Dream 1, dream, dream 2 again. So each being twice in the next six years. Everything exactly the same. Because I had no primary education, which experts keep playing on. But I was, you know, didn't take much notice. They were nightmares. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, when I left the naval training school, I went as an electrical apprentice to become an electrical engineer. And during that first two days, dockets I held had this strange thing on it, a cable two and then a small two at the top of the back of it. Mm -hmm. And I said to the foreman, what does that mean? Is that two squares? I said, what is two squares? They literally draw simply four squares, two on top of the other two. So I said to him, well, what's the value of them? And he just said, they nothing. It's just a form that we use. So I went down, I got the cable. And that night, I started thinking on this, squares. Mm -hmm. Why are my dreams, always the hopscotch, are always in squares? As I say in my newsletter, why not oblongs, why not circles? Yeah. Why not some other shape? Why always three squares, and in a particular order, three squares, vertical, two horizontal, one vertical, and two horizontal. I have always got my pebble on square three. That turns out to be a marker. That's the first true square you can work out. But it also says a lot more than that, which would take ages to run through. Right, right, pain. right. But still, it led you on the path, uh, mathematically or what, however your mind works, but it led you on the path to say, wait a minute, science maybe has it wrong here when it comes to... Uh, an important aspect of creating energy. So uh, you you developed this very first machine, and how long did it take after that to even perfect it to the point where you actually you actually produced at forty of these flying discs at one time, right? Up to forty. That's great. But the thing is, those uh, what we call the SEG these days is that a long term. I recently used, and of course, the Japanese asked me. To reduce it, nobody would, in our order, the cycle was too long. And they suggested SEG, the cell effect generator. Uh, the, these ones we made took three months to make. It was um, only for our own use, for our own investigation work and study, because they were backed financially by 13 old age pensioners. But he wanted to see what I was talking about was real, could be done. Mm -hmm. And I thank them because without them, the SCG would never have been developed. They gave me the option. But I had a condition if I want that backing. I was not to go commercial. And I honored that right to the last one that uh, was left. The others had died or gone. So he couldn't afford to support it. So I had to rethink and decided from that moment to look at the commercial field. Mm -hmm. Surely the commercial field would benefit from a disc. 
that could take off from anywhere without any per, uh, any prepared site, uh, which really don't need insurance cover. Right. There's nothing to go wrong with it. And certainly if there's no fuel to keep loading on it. You're not limited to go anywhere, and speed is there. That's what a businessman wants, speed. He wants to get from A to B the shortest time at the cheapest cost. And the ITB offers him that. And, in fact, the car uh, transport offers you sooner. You don't have to stop anywhere to refuel. You're not making pollution. And you, whatever the weather is, you turn on, you go. No problem. And when the body, you don't like the body anymore, you take the body off and dump it and get a body you like and stick on and the way you go. In fact, in the, in the 60s and, and 70s, you were making quite a few trips from England to Australia and all around, and it was witnessed oh, by yes. hundreds and thousands, actually over a thousand people, uh, and then the government knew what you were doing. And didn't the Russian government at one point get very interested in this and you uh, kind of worked with them? And what happened with that? Because they never really uh, uh, continued What it. happened, uh, I used to be a radio ham operator. Mm -hmm. and we got contact with this uh, man in, in Moscow who was a teacher, a science teacher. And while we're talking, we were talking, remember, there's a Cold War. Yes. And here I am talking openly with a man in Russia, and we are discussing space. He's talking about their uh, successes and how it came about. I'm talking about the IGB to him. And then we had a place in Archangel. It was quite near a bridge, a railway bridge, where I was offered to park any vessel if I, vessel if I needed to hide it. So I could fly in and out of Russia with no problem at all. They would send me goods, tea chests full of goods, and it has the uh, Russian seal on stamp that was never opened. It came straight to me, and we had a communication big where I could understand what life was like in Russia. I was carrying it, to, uh, sort of confirming mm -hmm. how we live, how our money was spent, cost electric and that. So they were pretty identical between the two of us. So I got to understand, you know, how people were, how their structure goes, how they move up into better accommodation as they go up the ladder in skills. So I learned quite a lot. And then because I had, was forced to move, I lost contact. Equipment had been stolen. I had to move on right. to find another home. And therefore I lost contact with a man. It, it was interesting, too. Uh, there was a really imp important reason why you didn't want to patent your invention, because if you patented it, you would have to basically give out all the secrets. And you were afraid that there would get into the wrong hands. And to this day, you have refused to really officially patent it. Am I correct? In that? You are correct. Um, in the 63, when I filed a patent, three months later, they came on the phone and said, this is a know-how. Don't ever patent a know-how. You give everybody the know-how, and they just dump you that you won't be needed. So I, I dropped the idea, and of course, the patent application died after 12 months or 18 months it died, and wasn't renewed. But last year, at the end of last year, my back in the UK want me to patent it. And I told him, God, around, uh, we do need to. So we raised to be the patent office. We, yeah. In January, no. the uh, backer again came and said, no, I want to go back to patent people again with the lawyer, and we want to ask them. Now we've got a demonstrator here. We'll take it and show them to see if we are able to take a patent yet. And we showed it. And when we finished they said, right, you can fill in the application now and hand it in. But remember this. If you patent it, we release it to the world to see. And if you want to make money quick, patent it. But you're talking about the, the planet, its health, and 
how you want to protect it. I totally understand. We're talking to Professor John Searle. He is the inventor and creator of the Searle Effect Generator. And there is a great documentary out there. It's called The John Searle Story. The John Searle Story. And we will have uh, uh, all those links on our website and also on my Facebook page. We have a few minutes before we take a break here. If you would, generally, tell us about all those attempts from companies to kind of get their hands on this machine and any maybe threats you had from people who wanted to get the information from you about this perpetual motion machine, essentially? Right. Let's talk about this here. As a, I can give you examples. Sure. Hey, just three, four days before I prepared to come up here, our chap in Canada was telling me, do not go to Tesla uh, Society show. They can't help you. Hand all the details, I'll send it over I have got more money than Boeing and NASA got to back it. Now, Arthur, <laughs> who on earth as a single person has more money than they have? And I wouldn't agree. He tried for an hour. Wow. Then two days later, he had another chap who was demanding me to hand over everything to him. He was sorry. He changed the name of the... SEG, because I say no, he went to Brad Ockerman, no, and he was connected to me to get him to sign it. He said no. He then went to our engineer, Morris, and Morris said no. He went to our chap on the fine side working on the IGP, mm -hmm. see if he would sign it, but we had warned him not to, so he refused. And at last attempt, he came back to me to uh, beg me to sign it. And I told him, hey, you don't have 10 million. Certainly, you're not a legal body. And thirdly, we are not for sale. Good for you. By the way, we are talking to Professor John Searle. He is live from the Tesla Tech Conference as we speak about his machine. And when you uh, Google, and I know a lot of people are just hearing this for the first time, you are going to be blown away. And I'm going to have lots of links and, and clips. Pete, if you would, if you can, if we got time, let's play the uh, clip. This is going back to Warminster uh, when he was testing out some of these discs that look just like UFOs. And two police officers were describing this. Again, they thought it was some sort of alien craft. And this is what they were saying to the media. Well, the, the object was uh, likened unto a cross. Consul Willie just uh, said, here we go then, and uh, we drove off after it, if you know what I mean. We were traveling very fast. Um, no, no sign that I heard at all. It was, um, there was no outside uh, noise apart from the noise of the car itself. And the, acceleration, the acceleration away from us was terrific. So, really, we didn't get under it to hear any sound. It was, it was definitely there. It was definitely either manned uh, by some sort of being or remotely controlled. It was definitely being controlled to view our car. I know it's hard to understand, but on the documentary, you know, you see the footage. In fact, I'll have clips where you can see the video of that uh, on my Facebook. Uh, it's on the John Searle story, the great DVD and documentary about uh, this incredible man. We just we have a minute or so before our break, and then we'll have more time, much more time when we continue. As I describe this to the listeners, and I'm calling it a, in a sense, a perpetual motion machine. Am I saying is that accurate? I mean, is it just pretty much take stuff around it and doesn't use any uh, resources and produces an infinite amount of energy? Is am I uh, overstating that? Dr. Searle? Professor Searle? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? I have a lot of noise on the line here. Oh, you do have a lot of noise? All right, I'll tell you what. Hold on, Dr. Searle. I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll, have, we'll try to call you back and get a, a better line, okay? Right. All right, all right. Hang up, and we'll call you right back and try to get a clearer line. All right, uh, 866. Well, actually, we're not going to uh, take calls for Dr. Searle at this point. Uh, we're going to take a break because there's more I want you to hear about this. And we're going to keep them to the top of the hour. And coming up at 5 o'clock in the second and third hour, it's Dr. Marty Becker, America's favorite veterinarian. 
uh, from Good Morning America and Dr. Oz. He's always great. We'll take your calls on dogs and cats. But this is just incredible. During the break, go to the John Searle Story. Dot com and uh, you can see some more information. It's Professor John Searle. Don't go away. It's uh, great to have you along. This is one of those times uh, uh, it would be great if everybody had a computer nearby so you could see some of the images, but you can certainly do it when you get home. A uh, great website to start with, the John Searle Story dot com. That's S-E-A-R-L. We are talking to Professor John Searle, who... Wow, 1946 built his first prototype of this Searle Effect generator. And to this day, he hasn't uh, patented this because of various reasons. And the technology got to the point he built 40 of these levitating disks that were perpetual motion machines. He still has the information, and he wants the right people to get involved. And just as we welcome you back, John uh, if you would tell the folks listening the potential use for this machine and how it really literally could save the environment, if it works, as you say, for travel, uh, for health, and for various things. Talk about that, I, I, just so we can paint a picture. Well, first of all, the Surfec generator is simply a linear motor operating on a magnetic bearing. Mm -hmm. It is basically a converter. It sucks in the electrons from all around the fabric, heat, any object of, of a, what we call energy level, it draws it in. All this is random motion. What it does, it forces into uniform motion. Now it passes through the system and is converted to useful electricity power. But the beauty is it's not burnt in any way. We don't destroy it in any form. So the electrons coming out are still perfect. All they've done is release the charge energy that they built up passing through the system. So in other words, this is an absolute clean device. Beautiful the home, in the home, the housewife. We have a perfect machine when she scored her hands with steam. Just turn your hand towards the generator, and a few minutes, the stinging effect is gone, it's cool, and eventually, in the hour, you see the redness gone. Everything is back to normal. And what another advantage is for the home is that dust particles fall to the ground. Oh, really? The room goes negative. Dust particles cannot float in a negative state. So that's on the floor. Dust carry viruses bacteria which line up the nose and it makes you sneeze, makes you ill, and often kill you. What this does is to give you a better lease of life. But bear in mind, you have no electric bills to pay, you've got no threatened strikes that your power will be cut off and you don't know when the strike will be cleared. You've got nothing. You've got a freedom, peace of mind. And this is vital. It reduces the stress that you're going through every day. Worried to pay the bill? Are you going to pay to meet it? In your room, you will feel happy 24 hours a day. I know. I work two or three days at a time with no sleep, so I know. I know. In, in fact, I, I read that uh, you were powering your house with this device, and they thought you were stealing electricity, and they confiscated your machine at one time. Is that correct? The well, the, the true story is that the family, member of the family, sold me to the electric board for £30. <laughs> then they came with the CID to check me out. But uh, what happened then? Nothing really happened. They just said, yes, I think it, it must have been taking the electricity from the grid because we had switched back to the grid when I sense something was wrong when I saw a CID man I knew because yeah. he worked on my team and uh, so I guess something was wrong so I reversed back to the grid because I could switch from either my generator or the grid and uh, they came in they couldn't find no picture of that and he said we think probably it does because the 
pavements in the meter are always low. If so you they left it at that, but then they put sent me. Uh, what happened then was the girl who sold me to the next day and her boyfriend broke in the place while I was at work, smashed the meter open, and took all the money out. Oh, and that's and why they the thought the door open, right? And went. Well, of course, I uh, when I got home, I saw no electric meter smashed open. So I had to call the electric board to replace the meter, which meant that I now had to pay twice as much as unit to recover the money that they had stolen. Oh, what a mess. Well, the point is, he was using this device to get that free energy. And, of course, everything was, when they realized what was happening, you know, he, he wasn't in trouble. Uh, but what's... Uh, mainly uh, what happened was that uh, they, I went to the head office because they was demanding this 400 pounds up front. And uh, I went down and said, no, why? Why should I pay? He said, well, you have to pay because our inspector went and he wasn't really happy. Oh, yeah, happy. yeah. Well, no, it's totally understandable. The thing I want to talk about here, because we this is really part one, and we're going to have the producer and director of the John Searle documentary uh, on as we do part two in a week or two. And to talk about this incredible story, but the, I wanted to kind of lay the groundwork with you today. What we're talking about here is something that uses magnetism, and and, and it's it's kind of amazing as people listen to you talk, trying to envision how we could have somebody out there with this device, and it's not being used, it's not being implemented, it's not getting into the society's hands. What do we need to do to get this thing to work and for people to see this uh, working and operating? Well, let's, let's put it this way. I wish I was in the studio with the device. Mm -hmm. Because when you see it, you see what a beautiful device it is and how awesome it is in, in this movement. And, that, and it would be more easy to you as somebody they know on the air to explain what's sitting beside them because then it's easy for them to believe it's real. Yeah, well, you want to take a... About it, the question is, is so making it up? It, it, you, when you, you did these flights in the 60s and 70s that were witnessed by many people and you were flying in different locations, give me an idea how fast you could get from A to B, not that you did this, but if you were going to go to the moon, for example, how long would it take in the Searle effect levitating disc? Well, we would call it a bus ride to the moon. We would do it the R, any weather, any condition. We know that from model testing. That it would be, and the bigger the craft is, the better. Uh, even the uh, International Space Station, you can say that's just a bus ride. An hour you're there. An hour. It, most time is spent is pulling out the air, the atmosphere, so that you don't disturb it. If you disturb it too much, it will knock houses down, trees, uh, for quite a distance. So we do have to call out the atmosphere. But once we clear of it, that's no limit. Uh, we can get there now, now if we wanted to, but then we lose contact with Earth. Uh, the radio signals wouldn't be able to uh, keep pace with us. So from the point of Earth and, and any satellites around the Earth, we're talking about an hour, trip there and back. So that's a daily job, taking goods to the International Space Station, take goods to the Moon. But when we come to things like Mars, the, the ITP really is the ideal machine because we could, regardless where Mars is in respect to Earth and what the weather like, we could guarantee a two-month trip regardless. That means we'll be in position for Mars to meet us, not us mm -hmm. meeting Mars. Mm -hmm. Mars will meet us. The trouble is with this, though I know we'd be okay for water, it's the food. Yeah, how much uh, has supplies, much, right? We've got food. In the, in, in the, now, this is going to be like a silly question because it, we're, I'm putting human terms or I'm putting traditional, uh, you know, 
I guess, terms as far as aerodynamics. But when this craft would turn at those very, very fast speeds, was there any kind of centrifugal force problems? I mean, when you were in this machine and traveling, like you could go from England to Australia in 20 minutes, what did it feel like inside the craft going at those huge speeds and, and turning, making uh, maneuvers? Uh, no, people are always wondering about this. It's, you know, as you sit in the chair, that's one G. And uh, in the car, it's half G. Mm -hmm. So you're half the weight you are. Your brain feels better uh, because you, you're that half weight. Your bones feel better. And you have greater oxygen supply. And the beauty about it, because you don't feel movement, you don't feel the takeoff, you won't feel the traveling, uh, you'll be from A to B, you won't know you even started until the pilots say, oh, we're just about to land. Then you get a surprise with air. Um, but facing it from all, a businessman wants speed. He wants to be get from A to B in the shortest time at the cheapest cost. Guaranteed. The IGB gives you that guarantee that it will always oh, yeah. leave at the time stated and you'll always arrive at the place stated. There will be no question, sorry, we are delayed by 10 minutes. Sorry, we are not late, there's bad weather. I mean, none of that. It's go, 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 regardless. It, how many of these machines do you currently have? How many of these 40 discs do you still have intact? Well, what happened is because, you know, we, we still were limited for money, we stripped each one, as we finish the work we want to do with it, and use as much as that as possible towards the next size. At the moment, I think that looks pretty like it's going to be the same. We will build one, and when we've done all the proving, we then strip it, use as much of it again for the larger, next larger one, and we move forward in a similar manner. Uh, but I don't worry. The thing is, we will start with a man craft. We're not starting with an unmanned craft. Right. Time. Right. Has uh, to be do, done in the USA. Yeah, we'd love to see that here. We'd love to see more of this. And I'll tell you what. Let's take our uh, yeah. Go ahead and take. Let's go ahead and take our break. And we have one more segment as we continue with Professor John Searle. And again, a lot of what you're hearing probably you're trying to put two and two together. And how can this be? Do the research. Good way to start. In fact, if you go to my Facebook page, I have links uh, to some of the videos and some of the uh, documentary footage uh, that you can get an idea. And as you watch it, believe me, you're going to say, oh, I remember seeing that old black and white footage somewhere of these levitating discs. And you probably thought it was uh, like they did in Warminster. You thought it was alien crafts. It was him. It was his crafts. All right, we're going to take a, a break here. You hold on. We'll do a few more minutes in just a bit. And when we come back, we may take a call or two, may not, because in this early uh, part one, we're kind of laying the groundwork. 866-482-1011 is our number. 866-482-1011 is Professor John Searle, the godfather of the free energy science. It's good to have you along. Welcome back. We're going to spend a few more minutes with Professor John Searle, who is in America and at the top of the hour, this is just laying the groundwork because we're going to have John back and we're also going to have the uh, producer of the DVD documentary that is just out, the John Searle story. You can also go to the John Searle story. On my Facebook page, you're going to find lots of links already uh, if you happen to be near a computer. I guarantee you, tonight when you get home and you start Googling, looking at these links, uh, you're going to be amazed. Uh, uh, welcome back to the show. By the way, folks, at the top of the hour, right after the news, we have uh, Dr. Marty Becker, America's favorite veterinarian, to take your calls about your dog and cat. And he's going to be here for the rest of the show. So that's great. Uh, John, it's great to have you back. And in America, you are now speaking to us live from the Tesla Tech Conference. You're in America and at your, I mean, I hate, to, you know, when I bring up your age, I feel uncomfortable, but you're not embarrassed. You're not ashamed. You were born in 1932. Is that correct? That's correct. And for you, and for you at this age, 
after all these years and holding out, even despite the threats and companies who wanted to buy out and, and the Russian government and all the other governments who knew what you were doing, you're holding out. And here you are in the country. What are you doing in America? What do you, what do you want to see happen with this perpetual motion machine? Um, first of all, we need a site to set up the lab and the production line when we're ready to start production. Mm-hmm. But, but nice place would be California to be near Hollywood so they could actually record everything we do as archive reference to the future, who did what and where. I would like to meet the president himself face to face and instruct him on the benefits of the SUG for the whole of the USA, to make the deserts greener than they've been for a thousand years, to make people feel more happy, less stress out, more employment for people, improve the air, reduce the pollution, improve, improve the water, and therefore the livestock benefit. All our pleasures will be plant more trees. There's a hell of a lot of work to do. But I'm here. I'm prepared to be a leader, to lead the population, to get that work done and make America a paradise as in the eyes of the world. It can be done, it will be done, but we have the technology, we have the know-how, but what's missing is you. That's what's missing, and the hard cash. To yeah. get it, it, and you got to have the right, the right company or organization, and preferably government, I guess, to really get behind us. Uh, I guess yes, for people... Exactly want them. I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said, John? I said that we badly need to convert the governments to really clean energy drive. Right, right. If people are just... Just not just stand there talking about it. Do it. Yes, I totally agree. And make money at it. I mean, to to manufacture this device and to perfect it and to to get it into uh, the factory setting where it can be mass-produced, how extensive would the research and development be for producing this on a larger scale? I mean, what would it take? What would it take to produce this? Of course, we, we are having to redesign the structure. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of tests. Well, actually, uh, Ferrando Morris, uh, Morris in California been doing the work under my advice, and we have learned now that this new idea looks very highly positive. Uh, when we got the money, lab set up, I saw that in six months the magnetizer will prove that we can do it this way, which means mass production guaranteed. And that means production lines could be set up if there's only one to start with. If that's only producing 100 SEGs a week, that would be 100 people reducing pollution that otherwise would be making. I think that in two years, we would see more than one production line pushing them out. There could be thousands coming out each week from factories, which means that the pollution level would slowly... Go. It would take five years. I agree, it would take five years. We have made such so much pollution over the years that we, I don't see it being cleaned up for five years. But at least we have hope we have hope that we can clean up the mess, reverse the tide, improve the livestock, food, water, and the air from which we all benefit from. Absolutely. With uh, just a couple minutes we have, and again, we're going to do a part two. And joining John, the next time we have on, we're going to have the uh, producer and director of the documentary, The John Searle Story. We only got about a minute and a half, and if you would, Pete, when you do play the theme, play it real low. Uh, if you could, for people just tuning in, as I described the machine, is is it magnetism the big thing? Is it magnetism that somehow taps into energy around it? Is it that's is that the key to the machine, John? Yeah, I, I basically, as, as we close and get ready to say goodbye, I just want to kind of get clear in my mind for people who are listening to you. The power from the machine is basically magnetism that kind of taps into the energy 
around it, and that's where the energy perpetuates and continues? Yes. It, it, it's a, a clean machine. You're not burning nothing. You're just drawing in all the material from the fabric around it. Right. And simply compressing it in a uniform manner and output is electricity. But you have not made any pollution. Yeah, magnetic force that uses the yeah. electrons around it. Well, Professor John Searle, good luck to you at the uh, tech conference. Uh, stay in this country, and we hope uh, this all works out. And I'm going to do a lot more research on this, and uh, thank you for being on the show today. Well, it's an honor to be actually invited on your show. Well, you're very kind. It's uh, John Searle, Professor John Searle, and we'll have you on with Bradley Lockerman in the days ahead. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Just fascinating. All right, try it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, in a few days' time, you're going to be on. Okay. Uh, yeah, Brad gets to do round two. Uh, oh, Brad's been given the works. From here? Uh, better than me. No. <laughs> <laughs>